So I'll try to be, I try to share a couple of experiences and my background and context here is that I am CTO of Expert Maker uh, and I think that I may have some interesting experiences to share with you that, that might make sense, especially in the light of that some of you at least have gone through this training and have had a course and so on. And, um, I can put maybe a few things in, in a little bit different perspective based on what we actually have done with this company Expert Maker the last years. So I will be talking a little bit about the background. Uh, I will be talking about what's, what the current state is because there is sort of the average state of everything that relates to machine learning and so on, how we deploy this kind of systems and it's what in many cases what we call schoolbook AI. And I think it's important to understand that it's kind of different to truly scaled and large scale AI in many ways because it's not the same thing but it's, it has the same components underneath. I will be talking about data which I'm very interested in. Uh, and that's because most of today's system is about the availability of data. And it's not about algorithms anymore. <laughs> so the, the huge advantage lies in if you have lots of good quality data, you can do very well with almost anything you can find out there. So you don't need to solve the mathematical puzzles. You need just, if you have really good data and know what to do with it, you can create really interesting systems that pushes the limit in many interesting ways. So data is important because often the question is not so much about algorithms. It is how we treat and how we work with the data itself in order to create something that's important. And it's often we transform things. We add new information to already existing information, creating a new whole. And that's, um, that's that total, I mean, systemic thinking is what I'm going to tell you about a little bit today. And then, of course, we need to talk something about the cutting edge. I believe that Expert Maker is actually, we are a company that works on the cutting edge because we do what we do, we are deploying AI, machine learning, data mining uh, in different forms and shapes for very large organizations. And we do that today only in the US, even though we are based here in Malmö. We don't, I don't think we have any customer in Sweden currently, actually. So, so that's, um, so I will be talking about the edge and I will also, if given time, speak a little bit about optimization and automation because those two topics are very important because in the end, everything is optimization. Uh, even in, in the light of all these techniques that we see and so on, it's about doing something in an optimal fashion. And then everything comes down to optimization in the end. And life itself is in sort of an optimization process. Evolution is optimization and so on. So we are, we are, we'll be at least touching a few topics there. And I will show you a couple of real world cases that we've been working with. Just touch a little bit. And just to look at some, um, yeah, some aspects. And I am told that I should limit myself to about 40 minutes. Uh, that that's good. So, and as I said, this is a very, very large, of course, uh, domain and presenting it in a meaningful way in a context like this is, is can be a, a challenge, of course, but I, I'll be trying to keep it on more like on the experience level from actually deploying these kinds of systems rather than going into any specific details. And then hopefully we can end up with having a chat afterwards when I'm ready and when I'm done here. And um, yeah, that's about it.
So, we know it's lots of hype out there today. And the fact is that, and especially around big data today, uh, we see there are buzzwords, of course, data mining, business intelligence, predictive analytics, and so on. And everyone is basically the same thing. There are a few exceptions. Big data is a little bit confused. And uh, by many people, they are confused by the concept um, because mostly big data is about just a large heap of data. And someone confuses it with that a big heap of data will solve any specific problem. But that's not the case. So the case is always. And in artificial intelligence, the academic discipline, it's always been about big data. It's not, it's not a new thing because we know that if you are deploying something that learns from data, it's better to have a lot of data than have very sparse data. So if you have few data points, I mean, it's obvious and it's simple, but it's, so it's nothing really new. And artificial intelligence itself has been going on for quite some time. And, and even they, we started out with um, the really basic artificial intelligence a long, long, long time ago when we couldn't have computers. So we plugged in humans into a box that played chess <laughs> uh, in an efficient way, the Mechanical Turk. Uh, I think that that's, that's something we have been trying to do for a long, long time to find how do we implement intelligent things. So we even put people in boxes to solve that problem. Now we hopefully can do a little bit better, but even looking back, for example, 30, 40 years or something, basically the same problems was attacked and approached. And for example, these are just a few so-called expert systems. And they, for example, diagnosed medical diseases and so on. Uh, based on that we were giving our symptoms and we described them and the system would go through a number of rules that we have on the right here and it would just give us an answer. So you could build up large rule spaces. So the difference, and, and, and that's interesting because we, I mean, the systems were pretty advanced already at that point um, around, yeah, 1970, 1980, sort of that, then the systems were already quite good and AI quite mature as a, a, a research field and a lot of interesting methods come from that time. And we will see when looking at today, we see Jeopardy uh, masters being beaten by IBM's um, rapid computation machine, computational machines, the Watson computer, and we can see that it, it performs really strong and it can diagnose lung cancer and things like that on a very, very high level, so it's, so it's really advanced. We also have technologies like Siri, for example, in our iPhones, which is a strong example of a um, of a good artificial intelligence uh, application. So, so we might ask, what is different then between the old world, the AI from 1972, versus today's AI? The mission is basically the same, to make something more intelligent and to be more, maybe more compatible with us humans that operate the systems so that we get meaningful results from from the machines rather than not meaningful. So the question is, what is different? And in the light that the difference come from that we have, we see more meaning in understanding more, in producing more results that make sense to us. And looking at a new, just, we are flooded by new devices and we carry mobile phones, computers, tablets, we integrate everything, our homes and so on. So it's kind of, one difference is that we understand that we need to do something about the problem that we are getting lots of data coming from everywhere nowadays. And we need to make sense of all that stuff. So there is a general demand for it. 
in a whole different way than 1972, when you have some doctors implementing a system for diagnosing uh, some infectious disease or something. Today, everyone understands that we are flooded by lots of data, and we want to make sense of all the devices that we have. So we are only seeing the beginning of data mining, machine learning, artificial intelligence, because this problem with increasing volume of data drives a demand which is so strong. And that's why we can go back to, to saying that the hype that surrounds this field is actually real, because it is demand-driven, and we understand it. The problem is then, <laughs> is how do I make sense of all the different devices when I have all these separate islands of data that relates maybe to me and how I use my phone, etc. How can we make some sense of that? So we have lots of data and we all know that. And we have the largest corpus of information or the largest structure of information is of course unstructured data. It is the stuff that we generate uh, in terms of texts we write, photographs we upload, and so on. So we have enormous amounts of it. And I will, I mean, we are back to, if one wants to do something meaningful with this stuff, one needs to approach unstructured data, because there is no other solution. <laughs> because humans generate a lot of noise and, and, and unstructured things around us all the time. And we need to convert that into a space where we can make sense of it. Then, back to, if we go back to the former slide here, we also might have a, some slight problem because everyone is inventing their own ways of storing, handling, manipulating data. And then we need to bridge data. We have the holy grail in AI, I would say, is horizontal data integration. The question is, how do I take two disparate data sets and infuse them into something that can be analyzed and worked upon, even if they are not deterministically connected between each other? How do I make that connection between the data sets? Because they might be quite far from each other. So, so there are lots of data. So that's a, the, one of the the, the most prominent differences is the volume, the sheer volume. And back to the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all these soft uh, computing and so on is relying on lots of data to produce strong results. And of course, another difference is that we can combine a lot of things. There is much data available. That's a huge difference. And we also see that we can combine many things here. We can combine the AI we actually deploy and use in our systems. So we can have many types of algorithms working at the same time. We can also have massive processing power for nothing, almost. We can buy, I mean, I, I can buy 50 servers an hour for nothing. It's just $100 or something, and I can rent any type of computational level I want to have instantly, just by a few clicks, I can have that computational power. So computations is not the problems anymore. And it's, there are new ways of doing things more optimal and valid, you can validate data, uh, validate as the result of solutions in a much more efi efficient way. Then we have the bio-inspired computing. And most modern AI is based on it. It's, we can see it's coming from two large areas here. One is, of course, the brain itself. We all heard about neural networks and uh, different models. We, and we talk about intelligence, then we actually talk about something that relates to brains because we try to understand uh, the brain and so on, and we, we might get, get some ideas how we can implement a system that becomes smarter by mirroring the brain. I wouldn't say that it's the only direction today, because in many cases I, all, I skip artificial intelligence and just go for machine intelligence instead, because it's actually a limitation to have the brain as a pure model, I would say. Uh, but I can get back to that. I just, so this bio-inspired computing is also taking a lot from evolution as a model. 
And why is that? It is because evolution can be easily implemented in, uh, in computer software. And I can use evolution in order to improve the performance or improve the, the, the models I create in such a way that it's, it's absolutely the road ahead. Because optimization is difficult, always. Uh, and it's in a mathematical sense, it's a complicated domain. But evolution is a very simple model and it's very robust and strong. We know it builds us, so, so it has the potential to build basically anything. So these two are sort of the, um, it's, a, it's a good and interesting direction. And then we go to machine learning. I just move rapidly, and you all, many of you have already seen this. This is a typical machine learning process. We take in some data to the left, on point one and two. We do something with it. We often wrap it around a little bit. We adjust some numbers or prepare the information so that it can be efficiently used for machine learning. Then we send it the transformed side. We send it through some kind of um, training and we run. So we teach a model based on the actual data that reflects something historical. It can be anything. It can be how we recommend products. It can be a decision support. It can be an estimation of a number for the stock market, for example, into the future or whatever we want. Then we have some validation. So we, we test the system and we, so we can get some feedback so the system can tell us, is this valid? Is this good? How much error did we get? Is, how can we improve? And when we get that back, we can train even better. So we can rapidly reiterate that. And if we are successful, we can create a predictive model. And the predictive model can then, we can load unseen data, new customers or new patients or whatever it might come in from that direction in point number nine. And we can run them through the model and get a result. So that's the standard pipeline. This is the typical school book example of how a machine learning process works. And we will see that, and this, we will see that it has limitations. So often in a real massive environment, in a large scale system, we don't see this straightforward thing. We have many, many boxes in the model that we deploy. So many different things coming to this that it's, it's very different from this standard way because this is easy. But when you have actual customers, live customers, you have requirement to produce, you have a certain number of milliseconds to produce an answer, you need to monitor, you need to feed back in real time, retrain model, you need to do lots of other stuff in that pipeline, then everything becomes complicated that's represented in that picture. Uh, especially when it's scale, like many millions of customers, hundreds of millions of products, or something that's really a substantial amount of data, then everything becomes com complicated. So the schoolbook AI is often uh, ridden by, it's simplified a lot. It focuses on methods and a few steps. So we don't have all the performance, the pre-processing, feedback mechanisms, feature extraction in real time, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have uh, source data combinations in real time coming in from maybe 30 different databases or feeds in real time that needs to be combined now and then goes into the model. How will that update the model? How will it affect the model and so on? That's, uh, that's not the focus. And then, of course, very little focus on heuristics as well. Because in traditional machine learning that we have today, heuristics means that we can have rules of thumb introduced so we can add some human insight and knowledge into the mix. Uh, and it's often encoded totally different than the training sets are encoded. For example, we know that from grocery, retail industry, it's always a winner to recommend uh, a customer offers on alcohol they respond very well to that. We know that. <laughs> and, 
And it's a problem if a recommender would focus a lot on alcohol for every customer, or almost all customers, many of the customers that actually consume alcohol, and start to reinforce that. That might be a re relatively negative cycle. But it's a recommending system if just going, looking for data, historical data, the fact is that people respond well to an offer on alcohol. And that's, then it's a problem, because you might not, as a grocery chain, want to recommend people alcohol all the time. So that needs to have heuristics. It needs to maybe have some domain knowledge that goes in, and someone says, hmm, but maybe we should just push back the alcohol. So, so that's the heuristic part. And it's often a real practical, I mean implementation, that goes, for example, the large search engines. They have tons of heuristics. They have production systems. They have if-then rules. <laughs> so if I type a ticker symbol from the stock market, I know that it will show up on top of the search result. But that's just because someone has put in a rule there. It's not statistically der derived. It's a rule-based thing. So we also have open source. And it's good because it's free. So we can use a lot of open source stuff. But it is what we call baseline most of the things. If you want to have more competitiveness and be in the forefront, you need to do something else. So I would say that it is also relatively costly and complicated to deploy open source systems because it's not tightly integrated enough. Uh, and it's not scalable on a truly large scale basis because even if it's good at representing large, store, large number of data pieces that's stored, for example, in a uh, large graph database or whatever, uh, then that might be good. But in a scaled machine learning uh, deployment, it might not be so good because it might take too much time by being too distributed. You might need to push it back to very, very fast machines instead of having a distributed system and so on. So there are trade-offs between how much we can use open source in a realistic level. For example, we work with eBay, and that's a very scaled problem, of course, uh, and we, we have no open source, actually, in, in, in a solution like that, because nothing is, uh, it's not usable. So, so that's, that's uh, and it, of course, depends on what you do. Because if you have a global optimization problem, it's not good spreading it on multiple servers. You need to take it back so you can compute the whole model. Because if you have a global optimization, it's, you cannot just chop it up in smaller pieces, send them out to other computers, then bring ha home the results and aggregate. Because you're actually optimizing every aspect of it at the same time. So, so there are um, many, it might be um, many interesting uh, differences there. But it, it's still very good that it's available a lot of interesting open source software, and it can be used for many interesting solutions that maybe have different requirements than the ones we are doing. That's for sure. And um, I'm very positive we are also working on open source solutions. So, so we think that that's a great idea anyway. So, uh, I will be talking a little bit about data, and I will be showing you actually because it's uh, maybe somewhat more fun. Because we have a problem, and it's many statistically derived techniques, like machine learning techniques here. They they connect the dots by looking at interactions. For example, people. If I have lots of products I sell. I can look how people buy. If I buy an iPhone, I also buy this thing together with the iPhone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And by looking at behaviors, we can connect the dots in the data sets. So we uh, and then we can help people recommend. If you buy an iPhone, then this is a valid product for you. The problem is, of course, that we have long tails everywhere. When you have a scale problem, it's a long tail. You have massive amounts of data for a small number of products. But for most of the products, you have very few data points. So you can actually, and that poses, of course, it's normal distributed as well. So now we have a really bad problem here. 
because if I have too little data, I will move toward randomness. I don't have any data points to connect my products in this large database. If I have too many products I operate on the head, I only get what I expect. It's top lists. It's simple as that. It's just what I get. So, so this means that if I'm going to do a statistical recommendation solely based on available data that is long-tailed, then I have a relatively narrow window in the middle of the normal distribution that I can operate on. And that creates huge problems. So I often need to address how do we look into more, what can I do with the products I have, for example, if I do a product recommendation system. So we need to extract features from data. We need to transform data in efficient ways. For example, going through a number of products. And we can use a number of tools to simplify this process. And Expert Maker, we are developing this kind of tools. And I, I thought I should just run a very simple example for you. Uh, so you see how we can treat data. And it's, so I'm starting up an Expert Maker uh, knowledge designer. Let's see what kind of resolution I get, but that's fairly good. So I have some data. It's just a toy data set, but it's just only for demonstration purpose. We have some um, variables here. It tells us about whiskey products. So we have a number of whiskey bottles here that have a small text and a picture. And you can see we have all these old whiskies and more younger and so on. We have different types of them. So we have a relatively simple problem. We have um, a manually classified data set made by an expert in whiskey. And uh, we are using 12 variables. So it's very, very small. A normal problem, a scale problem would be 1,000 variables, 1,000 dimensions would be a scaled problem, just to put it in perspective. So they are like uh, type, age, and so on. Do, do you need more testers? <laughs> <laughs> we will require a few, yes. Uh, so this data set is connected via a number of examples. So we have, for example, uh, different types of whiskies here, and someone has said, okay, this is in the age group, it's smoky, price high or low, or et cetera, et cetera. So it's been classified. So this data set, this is a typical toy data set for machine learning. And we can see that looking at a similarity network, we can see that they are connected implicitly by the fact that they they relate to each other and are connected by the fact that they have different examples describing these different products. So we can see that, and that, that's prob probably different types of whiskies. They will be closer to each other depending on the different, how they are classified. So, but what's the problem here? Yeah, the problem is that this is a small database. If I want to classify thousands of whiskey bottles, that's not scalable, or millions if there were, uh, we need to do something else. And the question is then, what would that be? Yeah, first of all, we can say that let's take out everything. We knock out everything. Or let's, let's just look at one aspect, which is interesting that you can do when you have uh, a lot of data points already in the data set is that we can, uh, we can run different tools to, uh, um, let's see here. We can, for example, run a, we see that we have missing values in the data set. And we can run a tool that instantly helps us. If we have a number of data points already, we can just ask the system to fill in everything based on what you know, because it knows other examples. It can utilize other information aspects. So we get a complete data set instead of a sparse data set. So things like that can speed the process for building uh, this type of structures. 
So now we'll do something really radical here, just to show you that even though we had some structure in this data set, uh, and it's, it's lots, it's manually crafted, so it contains lots of structure, lots of good structure, and, um, uh, and we can view all the different aspects, we can mine it in many different ways, and we can turn it around and so on. So I'll just knock out everything we know. And we look at, now I don't have any dimensions left. And looking at my example matrix here, I only have the outputs, the whiskies. So I've cut out everything. And now I'll go for, instead, try to run a um, text feature extraction. Meaning that I run a simple process on the data. And we can see that I got a lot of new variables here. So, and they are called like text things. They are, have more abstract names. And we look at the data. It's just numbers. So we have converted all the texts into numerical form, describing the same data space, right? We didn't know anything about the whiskies now because I, I took out everything that's been put into this data set, knocked it out, and then we allowed just to extract it, transform it into numerical form instead. Okay, so what happens here? Let's look at the distributions here. We can see if there is something in it. Yeah, we have some interesting distributions. We don't know really what this means. It's very abstract numbers. Uh, it's just, um, but it has a, at least a distribution. We know that it's real, that it varies and so on. Let's look, at, uh, let's look at the structure. Suddenly we can see that uh, even though I didn't have any information about it, I still can produce very good results. Just from transforming it into this new space will pretty much rapidly, even if it's in numerical form now between zero and one, I can still have a lot of value from that information. And it's connected in very much the same way as we saw before. What, what is the text behind it? Is it a description of the whiskey? It's just, yeah, it's a short description. I can show you the, uh, the descriptions. They look like this. It's a very small text. You see black velvet, two lines, or a few sentences that was the basis to produce this large space of it's numbers. It, and so on. it has many different aspects. So there are features. They describe the same thing. And now what I can do from that, yeah. Are you using the images in any way? We can do that as well. We can do that. I can show you. Because that's a good, um, it's a good example how to get more and more information. Because it's really convenient for me if I want to create a feature extractor I want as many aspects as possible. So now I can actually, I can publish this model. I can, if I find new text for whiskeys, they can just go in my model. I get out metadata, which I can use to create a better machine learning. So that makes it really convenient. And let's do the same thing for, let's remove everything again. Because often it's a question about if you have little data, move incrementally by getting more and more and more aspects. And the more you know, the better you can classify other data that's out there. So it's sort of a, a repetitive process in order to increase the value of existing information and even human endeavor, because it can start out by something small that an expert created. And then you can expand it using different techniques in order to generate huge value from one single brain, you can expand that by extracting more and more feature and continuing this pro refinement process in many different ways. And I can show you, now we have taken out everything again. So going back, this is my example matrix, nothing in there. And we do the same process again. For example, we say extract image features. I just go for very few image features just because we can have hundreds of different features coming from images. And it's actually 
it's a, a little bit depending here because this one is processing on our servers rather than on the local machine, but that's how you have set it up. But this one is actually working through the data on the server side. Um, so we'll have to see a little bit. Wait and see. Yeah. And we, as you can see in the heat diagram out to the right, we get lots of new data points. And I'll go down here and we have a look. We have a huge uh, structure here describing a lot of aspects. Uh, so we can get, and if we look at the, uh, we go into our um, network analysis, we can see now we are only running image features. And we can still see that it's shaping up very, very well because these bottles, they tend to have the same language for, for their images. So going for some really scaled um, looking at many of them, we can start seeing that it's quite, I saw that we, we start seeing groupings in different, it depends also on, uh, on the actual features you have selected, how far you go, but they are, there is lots of important structure there. So. The, the images, are they labels only here? There are only labels here okay. in this case. It's not bottles. You could have a classifier <laughs> telling if it's a label or it's a bottle, and then you can have different extractors for different types depending on what the first classifier said and so on, what type of image it is. And that's, that's how we work a lot because that's, the melody, because you are combining <coughs> AIs and you're combining them in order to amplify something when you are in the creation process. So, so that can be, you can actually create one AI that transforms the data before you create a predictor that will predict some output. <laughs> so it's a modeling process which is quite interactive. And that can also be automated in many ways. Let's go back to, because I can, uh, I will not delve too deep into the actual um, how to use tools. So I will move on to um, that given the fact that data is so important and how we process data and how we utilize data, we see that it's diminishing returns on algorithms. It's for sure an interesting research domain. There will be much more done, but the world doesn't need to focus so much on the algorithms themselves because there are so many good algorithms actually. But it's much more important to focus on what we actually put into the algorithms. Because if I have a really strong data set in terms of how it's created, if it's representative for all aspects, the variation is good and so on, we don't need so good uh, algorithms. We can use faster algorithms, simpler algorithms, but we produce a much better result than someone who struggles with improving 0.0005 in standard error, for example, which might be meaningful for someone, but in most cases, it's much more win on attacking data side, how we amplify ourselves using data. Then, of course, multiple AI. We talked about that a little bit. You can combine all, all these things, and that's combinations. You have probably heard about deep learning and so on because it's kind of a buzzword today. And deep learning is a process where you automate chains of hierarchies of processing, extracting features, higher and higher levels in a structure. So it's just connecting different types of AI. The input from one thing goes to the output of the other, making a system instead. And that creates much more, that is much more interesting than uh, perfecting an algorithm for some specific task. Uh, of course, multiple data sources pose a lot of challenges, I would say. It's, it's, um, it's even uh, on par of in, in a <laughs> true implementation, in a real world implementation, we often spend much, much more time sorting out data sources, streams, <laughs> integration aspects, data provisioning, and so on than we do on AI because it's so complicated especially for a really large company, that's very complicated to, to get uh, done because it's not an automated process and just, just finding out all these formats and so on and before and often data is in really bad shape. 
that's true, it's contradictions, it's missing values everywhere, it's problems, it, there are repeats in products and so on that needs to be found, uh, extracted, filtered out, transformed and so on. So it's not just this plain standard process in how we take some data, push it into a machine learning system. It's often a whole pipeline of things that needs to go into this. To take the data, to get it provisioned correctly, transformed, pre-processed for rapid processing. And yeah, transform is the key word here. It, it, it actually stops looking like the original form when it ends up at our, the door where the engine takes over to do machine learning, then it's often in, in a total different shape. So, and human heuristics, we talked a little bit about and the importance of heuristics. This is a little bit, it's an overview of a pipeline, what needs to go in. And often the important aspect here is that processing for machine learning is one thing and deploying, so that's on the left side, top corner and on the top right corner, a system for deployment where you actually put the AI that you have trained into production. That's two very different things because they need to have different way how we scale things when we, we actually implement it because processing may require a totally different configuration than actual deployment. Deployment is often it's based on how many people are using it, what kind of peak traffic do we have during a 24-hour cycle, etc., etc., etc. There are many aspects coming into that problem, and, but processing is completely different. That's the question is, is it, if it's a global problem, then it might, we might need to have very fast disk access because we cannot have everything in memory, but we need to view it as a complete model rather than a chopped up problem. Uh, so, it is, there are many thim things, if we look at simple versus difficult, in real world, even uh, the data acquisition, the ETL part is often a simple part. Uh, the extract transfer load in a classical database fashion. The machine learning is, can, we can consider that simple because <coughs> most machine learning algorithms, they are pretty good. But the only question is, are they optimized enough for running fast? That's another question. Because that's a totally different story. Uh, but most of them are good. And it's very simple to work on small or medium-sized data sets. That's always simple. But it's a totally different game when we move into really big data. Then it's very different. Like when you talk about companies like Facebook and Google and so on, they have really big data. And that is very different from, from using smaller sets, chunks of data, um, especially in machine learning. So that needs to be you need to structure the problem very, very differently in a uh, solution. And visualization is a relatively simple uh, task, but it's hard to do uh, good process automation. Uh, optimization is hard. Scaling is hard to implement in systems like this. And complexity reduction is hard to implement because Sometimes you want to reduce the complexity in order to learn something in a generalized fashion. So that's hard. And it's also very complicated with feedback and reinforcement. If that's done in real time, for example, if you have a recommendation system, then it might be difficult uh, when you, if you recommend people things or you give an output in some way, a prediction or something, and then you watch how people click what they click on. If they, you recommend five products and they always click on number three and four, that's a big problem, of course, because then you know that the ones you recommended as optimal, they are not chosen by the customers. So then you need to adjust. You need to reinforce new things here. And that behavior is complicated in almost all settings, how we utilize that in AI, because should we retrain our models from the beginning? Should we start over? Or can we do it as an adaptive task, modifying things on the fly? And that's everything becomes more complicated with retraining 
uh, and we have adaptive things that needs to learn from current uh, real-time behavior. And of course, what I call systemic AI and what many also used uh, labeling deep learning, it's just a way of structuring th things like in a brain-like fashion and it's very hierarchical. Uh, it means that we actually are using something that we can predict might or extract a feature from, from might go into something else that can predict or extract other features from and so on in chains. And even deep learning is the more uh, brain-like approach that people use today. And it's based on, uh, I mean, it's based on reinforcements and it's based on that it can do automate the process a lot. It looks at many, many pictures, for example, and then it can extract how this structure would look like that with all these different components coming into it. But in, um, in a practical commercial world, we do it a little bit different because we can combine different modules, more or less. We can choose how, what to send into something, what to take out, what to send to other things, and so on, how to transform things. And that looks very much like the deep learning, which is a more automated process. Um, and the one we can create on a practical level is definitely more usable than a single uh, world AI where you have just one simple training session, you get some output from the system based on what you have learned, you can validate, but instead I think everything we deliver uh, is based on that you have multiple types of AI, multiple types of feature extractors that work together in a concerted way. So let's check the timing. I will round off pretty soon here. I was just about to uh, show you a couple, just so we have seen a few examples of um, just, just very, very quickly, I can um, see if we can start up th something. A, for example, a, um, a recommendation system that we have uh, deployed for eBay, um, which Red Laser it's called. It's um, one of the uh, largest um, uh, barcode scanning apps on the market. So we have about 30 million downloads for Red Laser, which is a scaled uh, solution and you have huge problems with the solution on that scale because 30 million users can create a r serious mess if you are delivering AI, depending on how much computational complexity you have. So if you have a complicated algorithms, they take more power, and then that creates a slight problem. It's not just like the old world where you measure things in bandwidth, how much data needs to go back and forth from the server, which is very predictable and simple. But if you add multiple types of AI, how will you then predict what the cost will be? How many servers will you need? Because the old world's load balancers, they look at how much traffic you have, not how hard the problem is to compute. So there are many things, and if you are hit by Black Friday, for example, like we are, traffic rises multiple times, over and over and over, and you think that now we hit the roof, it, it's all over, it just doubles. And that, that means an enormous traffic coming in during just a very, very few hours. And most systems cannot even cope with just a load balancer just to handle the traffic has problem adapting to peaks that you need to control. And think about having AI running there where you have some, some kind of computations that might be based on that. It first makes a decision about what AI it will use. And then it starts using different types of AI for different problems. So you suddenly have different costs in computations. So that creates a mess. So Red Laser, you can have a look at. It's what makes this very interesting is that it actually is, it's a combination. It's a hybrid model. So it uses both how people buy things. That's one aspect. It knows everything about the product. We have extracted features from every product and it's only about 70 million products or something. So it's not so big. So it's a relatively limited data set. In, in this context, but the 70 million products, it's, it's a few <laughs> dots on a map. 
Uh, but we done that, so we classified everything and extracted features from it, analyzed it to create new data that actually connects the products themselves rather than allowing the users to connect the products. Because the products, like the whiskey example, they also have connection between the dots, like product properties, price groups, everything, everything from anything that we can get hold of is extracted. And that's the, the reason is that the more we get, the smarter optimizations we can do and the smarter machine learning we can run. So, but then we can also add the collaborative part where you actually look at behaviors what people bought together instead because that can add interesting variation to the mix. So everything is mixed out in, in the end. We mix everything together and that is the final result that we produce. So, so it's actually hybrid in Red Laser. It's using every, anything we can, we throw at it. And that's because the data, the underlying data is of course problematic, especially when you are approaching things like if you have um, if you have a marketplace, some auction site or something, especially where people can upload stuff, they start manipulating anything they can in order to get higher up in the ranking lists when people search for something. So then you have a lot of problems with the data itself that needs to be fixed as well. And it can, for example, if you want to sift out, if someone is, let's say we have someone who is selling tennis shoes on an auction site, they s quickly understand that it's good to have many tennis shoes in there, but they cannot. So they invent that even if it's the same shoe, if they create new products for each size, then it's much better because then you get a larger degree of uptake in the search engine statistically. So that's good. The problem is that it gets very annoying for the people searching for tennis shoes, seeing hundreds of pictures, the same, 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 because someone has actually manipulated the system. And they even might be so clever that they change the text somewhat. So the system cannot recognize it's a duplicate. They only change shoe size as the major vari variation. So then you might need image recognition to sift through and see, ah, this is the same picture. They are repeating it. Then we have an image feature, so we can quickly see similarities to this product. Is if it's too close with other pictures, we see that, oh, wow, it's manipulated. Out with most of the products. I think we are on. Yeah. yeah. We just, because I know I need to round off pretty soon. Let's see. It's already 47. So, so I think it's basically, if you are interested, you can, you can start looking at it. What it does is of course it does barcode scanning so you go around in the stores you scan the barcodes of products and our system helps you find related complementary and so on and offers deals that are personalized on all levels and so on and so on so we run about i think it's about 10 different ai types also in the same model helping out with different aspects so Martin is interested in Barbie dolls, his huge passion in life. And we can see that this is what Martin scanned recently. And we can see that, for example, the recommended product is a Bratz Funkin' Glow doll, Chloe. Yeah, seems reasonable, it seems relevant. I'd buy it. You buy it, yeah, yeah. And and we can see door explorer color pill. Yeah, they seem, I mean, and, and now this is a very personalized mix on all levels. It knows truly about behaviors. It knows how products relate. It knows how to optimize the click through on products and so on. Does it know about Martin? It knows a lot about Martin, but I will not show Martin's. I will not show Martin's deep profile here, or his daughter, <laughs> maybe. Um, let me just go out. We can start, just touch on... Um, you have movie twist? We have yeah. movie twist, but we don't have uh, Vodafone. We don't have... Uh, I, asked, I was supposed to show a little bit Vodafone. We have launched a, um, a large... Um, it's a personalization app for news and so on, together with Vodafone. We started out in Spain. So I was about to show that, but Movie Twist is a typical example of something 
that can be built very fast, even with small resources. This was primarily made by a small company in Malmö uh, that did this. And it is actually a, um, a, an advanced movie recommender that knows about film. And, and this one, it starts out that I start exploring the space by finding a movie, for example, I'm interested in. And, and of course, the system starts to recognize other matrix movies that I searched for here. But it also understands how different movies are connected to each other, not by other people what they looked at. And it's even so smart that if I set it up to look at, for example, are there any old movies that would be very similar to Matrix today from before 1970, for example, or are there any specific actors or, and so on. When I start looking at more complex relationships, I can find a lot of interesting things. So, so I can tell the system just find similar movies and so on, which are completely normal and it, it can do a good job and find terminators or whatever it might be. And I can also go for more qualitative, how do I slide Martin in? Back. I'm not so uh, skilled in I the Yeah, yeah, we have a number of uh, exploration tools. So the system can do, for example, auto recommendation. And the auto, this is based on auto recommends but I don't know if it hasn't gone any search profiling. It's so it just learned from what I did recently, Matrix. <laughs> but the system will actually saturate and create my own automatic recommendations for movies. And uh, for example, we can go into um, Explore. And I can tell the system about properties like uh, I need less violence, I want a tr thrilling movie, etc. And this can be quite extensive um, because I can add like actors that I'm interested in and pace and so on. And then I click explore with as much fact as I have. And we can see that it thinks about it and then it starts to recommend movies broadly. And then I can say, for example, because it's, I see that it's some kind of, I got older movies mostly and then I can force the system in showing me more modern movies and so on. So this is an exploration tool and it requires lots of data. And the interesting part here is that an application on this level, you can do it manually because there are lots of movies, right? The, there are uh, even 1,000, 30, 50, hundreds, 200, 500,000 movies. Whatever the number is, it's too much to do anything manual in that uh, sense. So. Here we need to be very smart using many sources, take that down, transform it into something new that can be applied, and then package it neatly into this recommendation, discovery solution with many different discovery tools uh, that I can deploy. So that, but the, the, the whole system for this was done in three weeks, I think. Two, two, weeks. two weeks in deriving all this data. Normally, it would have taken many years, like, you know, the uh, Pandora system for music recommendation. I think they spent 30 uh, people for five years in order to classify music manually. And they, that's a continuous process they do to create the DNA of music, so to speak. This one is done in two weeks by different smart tricks using many sources, pulled together, transformed and handled as well as possible. Okay, uh, I think I'll stop there. I skipped the optimization part for today. So you have, uh, we can have a few questions maybe. Um, I know that we, um, it was slightly longer than expected. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs>